Battalion, 503rd Infantry Regiment, 173rd Airborne Brigade. My question to you, gentlemen, is due to ISIS uh, pursuit to uh, spread their ideology throughout the Middle East, do you foresee the United States committing more ground troops to a full spectrum operation within Iraq or Syria? I think right now, uh, sit down, please. Thanks for the question. I think right now our strategy is, which I think is starting to work actually, is for us to provide trainers and advisors to both uh, both Iraqi forces, Kurdish forces, uh, in order for them to take the fight to ISIS, because ultimately. It's their nation, and they need to be the ones who fight for it. We're working on also building a training program for the Syrian Free Army, uh, who's also fighting ISIS. And, and I think we're going to start a, this year, actually, we'll start a training program in training many different units there in order to fight that. And I think what will happen is ISIS will have to fight on multiple fronts against the Peshmerga, the Kurdish forces in the north, Iraqi security forces from the south and hopefully some of the Syrian free army from the west. And we're starting to see some progress, but it's going to be a, take a long time. I think this is a two or three year process at least that's going to take us to have some success. But right now, there's no plans to put US forces on the ground other than to do training and advising. And I think those numbers, you know, it's up to about 3,000 now in Iraq that we have on the ground. And we're still determining what number will be used uh, to train the Syrians. And so we'll have to continue to assess that and play it by ear. I'm not going to ever take off the table that we might not have to put some of our own soldiers on the ground fighting. But right now, that, in fact, is not the plan. And we're fairly happy with how things are progressing. And, uh, sir, I'll, the only thing that I would ask is that uh, readiness is the most important thing. You as a uh, uh, young uh, lieutenant and your platoon sergeant, if you have one, can do. And, and I would ask that you ensure, based off of the resources that you have available, that your soldiers are as trained as they possibly can to execute the missions that we're going to ask you to do. And if you focus on, uh, you know, uh, uh, decisive action uh, and making sure your soldiers have their kit, have their weapons, they can qualify with their weapons, they can, in fact, operate in a, a vague and ambiguous environment wherever we ask you to go whether that's in Eastern Europe as your recent experience or somewhere else in the world, we'll be successful in whatever it is that we ask you to do. So thanks for your leadership. All right, go ahead, First Corps. My name is Sergeant David Messer with First Corps, and my question has to do with the Married Army Copeless Program. In 2013, the law was changed for the Army to recognize same-sex marriages. However, some of the people would have PCS before they were able to get married and now don't gain any MACP benefits while being stuck apart for years at a time due to PCS policies. Uh, has this ever been brought to your attention and if so, is there anything that you know of in the works? Well, I think it's the, the requirement for same-sex marriages are the same for, for uh, heterosexual marriages is that you have to get married. And, and there, there are probably instances where there are soldiers of heterosexual soldiers who PCS before they get married as well. So it's incumbent on the two soldiers to commit to themselves. Once they're married, we, we will recognize that with full pay and be, full benefits, uh, whether it's same sex or heterosexual, it's, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, we look at both the same, it's, but it's incumbent on them to get married and have a a certificate that shows, in fact, that they've dedicated themselves to each other. Uh, I think you hit a spot on, sir. I'm not sure there's anything else to add to that. All right, go ahead, 82nd. Major, I'm Specialist Lyason with the uh, 2nd uh, Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division. My question is, as operational uh, expenditure uh, overseas decrease, are we going to see an increase in uh, training budgets to prepare for future operations? Yeah, so what I, what I would say is we're totally dedicated on ensuring, as Sergeant Major mentioned a little bit earlier, is training and readiness. And, and as we, we want to reinvest in the ability for us to do more complex, higher-end operations, 
And so we have now maximized our combat training center rotation. So we are maximized in the number of we're maximizing the number of for Irwin in California. We have rotations in Germany to our training center there. And we're fully funding those so we can ensure that units get absolutely the best training possible and prepare them for more complicated, complex missions. In addition to that, we want to increase the amount of home station funding that's available so you can do the proper gunnery and other things and training and squad training, uh, depending on your MLS, uh, in order to meet our need. That's our number one priority is to do that. And so we're not quite there yet, but we're working our way towards that. The only thing I would uh, add to that is you need to ensure that when it comes time to train that you're ready to train, that you're motivated to train, and that you understand what we're trying to achieve in the training event. We cannot afford to squander a lack of preparation and uh, when we go to execute training tasks, because money is tight, and, uh, and money and resources impact everything else we do in the Army. So I'd ask you as a, a young specialist in the, the mighty 2nd Brigade, 82nd Airborne Division, to help your team be better, and your part is to be engaged and be ready to train when it comes time for training. What's going to be different, I think, as we go into the future is that you know, over the last 12 or 13 years, we kind of knew we're going to Iraq, we're going to Afghanistan. And we knew that when you were going to rotate, we kind of knew when each unit was going to go. That's changed. And, and with the dynamic of what's going on in the international security environment, the difference is you have to be prepared to deploy anywhere. You know, today we have soldiers deployed on five different continents. We have people, soldiers deployed to Europe to reassure our Eastern European allies. We have soldiers deployed to Korea. We have soldiers deployed to the Middle East. Uh, so we, we just don't know what we're going to ask you to do. So it's really incumbent that we really focus on having a sustainable readiness capability that allows us to be ready. So it puts more pressure on the units to sustain a, a level of readiness in order to respond anywhere. And so for us, we got to get back to that. And I think that's what we're going to try to do over the next couple of years. All right, go ahead, Fort Benning. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Sergeant First Class Joseph from the 316th Brigade. My question to you, gentlemen, is uh, about the QMP board. What is uh, the plan for that for this year? I mean, good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Sergeant First Class Joseph from the 316 Brigade. Um, my question to you, gentlemen, is about the QMP board. How many more boards are there for this year? And due to the drawdown, what is the um, Plan, plan of action for if we need more troops for the foreseeable future. I'll take that one on. Uh, so uh, Chief just got a decision brief uh, in the last last month actually about whether or not we wanted to continue on the same board schedule uh, or to defer the board until later in the summer. And my recommendation to him and and, uh, and his decision was we will stay with the board schedule for the QMP. We do not want to maintain uh, soldiers who have misconduct in the formation. And so the board, starting with the Sergeant First Class Promotion Board, Master Sergeant and Sergeant Major, will all have a QMP board as part of the overall board process. We want to maintain the best qualified individuals who are disciplined, live the Army's values, are ethic, and believe in and are part of the Army profession. And if we've got folks that have not done that in their career, shown a pattern of misconduct, then we really need to tell them thanks, but we no longer need you in the Army. That'll continue uh, long into the future because we need to have a cleansing process in the Army to ensure only the best stay. QSP, which is the Quality Selection Program, which has to do with the drawdown, we have pushed that off slightly to the right. We don't need as many numbers as we thought originally, and uh, but that process will maintain as long as we continue to draw the size of the Army down in order to meet the, uh, the requirements we have as part of sequestration. And one of the things we have to be able to the challenge that we have, Sergeant Major and I have, is we have to balance the Army in terms of edge strength, readiness, and continuing to modernize to make sure you get the best systems, uniforms, weapons, et cetera, 
And so we got to balance that all together. So we got to determine what's the best way to do that. And we want to keep as much end strength as we can, but whatever end strength that is, and we got to make sure we have the money to make sure you're properly trained and ready to do your mission, and we're still able to give you good modernized equipment. And so that's the decision. Right now, uh, we're, the decision is we'll continue to downsize until 18, and until we get to 450,000 in the active component, 335,000 in the National Guard, and 195,000 in the U.S. Army Reserve. And we're headed on that path, and we'll continue on that path until uh, fiscal, until uh, uh, 2018. I use the stock. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Stock first class cook from our SOAC. Uh, question to you with uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault being the top priority for the Army. Uh, what are the guides we can give or training we can place for commanders to reinforce the standard for the uh, Army? I think there's a couple. We have a, you know, I have a staff element that's dedicated itself to developing training materials for everybody to use. In my opinion, the best training is interactive training, where you're able to bring a group together and really just have discussions, facilitate discussions about why we have this problem. Uh, you know, my my opinion is it's about not only sexual harassment, but it's about our profession that as soldiers we should be taking care of each other and watching out for each other. And we should never have another soldier attack another soldier. That, that simply, for, to me, is unacceptable, incomprehensible, actually. And, and so, so what we have to do is have training modules. We have training modules available that gives you ideas to do scenario-based training that allows you to put out scenarios and then have discussions at the lower level so people understand how people are thinking and what the problems are. You know, we have to, it is about culture. We have to have a culture where it's just simply not acceptable for sexual harassment or assault to happen in any form. Male on female, male on male, female on female. It's just simply something we shouldn't accept as a profession. We expect more out of our soldiers. We've got to have each other's backs because of all the hard things that we're, we're asked to do. We've got to be able to take care of each other. The only other thing I would add is, is that uh, we want to get away from saying here are the exact things that you need to do. I think at this point as an army we should know and leaders should know what it is we're trying to achieve and what we need to do in order to get there. And that you execute based off of your mission set using mission command to ensure that we're achieving our objective. For me personally I believe this challenge can be greatly resolved or reduced if soldiers recognize their true professional responsibility, their duty to their fellow soldier. You know, we are our brother's keeper. And if we're not going to, to look at it in that manner, then we're going to continue to be challenged with this issue. But our duty is to one another. That's who we fight for. You know, and we've got to recognize that and move forward as an army. Fort Lee, go ahead. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is 2nd Lieutenant Marshall, and I'm coming to you from Fort Lee, and I'm representing the 59th Ordnance Brigade. My question for you both is how did you balance such an accomplished military career with your family, and what is your advice for young military just starting out balancing a family? Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a great question, and uh, it's something that we, you have to really concentrate on. And, and I tell everyone that when I first came in the Army, I always said, you know, I came from a very strong Italian family background, and I tried to bring that with me into the Army as I came in. And I always said I'd put my family first. But in reality, we all know that you can't do that all the time in the Army because we're, we're asked to do things that simply don't put your family first and that you have to make sacrifices. But what you can do is what I have found, I've been married for almost over 38 years. I have three children, all grown, all doing very well. And what we were able to do is when I was there, we made it quality time. And we put time aside to make sure that we always took time for my family, whether I was a second lieutenant or whether I'm a four-star general. I still put time aside for my family, and I make sure it's quality time, and I, I stick to that. In order to be a good officer, a good NCO, a good soldier, you got to have balance. And you got to balance yourself between the dedication you have to show to your work 
and you got to balance that with dedication to your family and being a good father or being a good husband or a wife or a mother or a sister or a brother. It's important that you do that because that's the kind of qualities that we want, someone who cares about their family. So for me, it's important that you look for that balance and understand that there are going to be times when you're separated because that's kind of what we expect. But when you're there together, you make the most of it. And my wife and I talk about this a lot. And we have over the many years that we've been married. And, and I think it's worked out really well for us. It, it's hard. It's not easy. It takes compromise on, on all sides. But it, it's possible. And, and your family is going to be there once you're done with the Army. And so it's important that you do as much as you can with that. I am one that believes leaders need to set the example in, in making sure that they take the time to spend with their families and people see that. And I try to do that as, most, as much as I can. The only other thing that I would add is, uh, you know, real shortly, believe it or not, I'm going to be retiring. And uh, one of the proudest things about my time in the service is I'll be leaving the Army with my family. And that comes with recognizing that you need to be able to communicate with your spouse, You've got to be open and honest about what you're going to be expecting to do and what these jobs mean. And then, as the chief said, and I wholeheartedly agree, when you make time for your family, it has to be quality time. You know, when I look back on my career, most of my time has been with the Army uh, from an hourly perspective. Uh, but the times that I've taken for my family have been the quality times that I, I also cherish and remember. And, I think you just have to determine what your priorities in life are, discuss that with your spouse, and then have an open communication with one another to recognize that there are times, hey, look, I'm going to have to go someplace. I'm going to be gone. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to deploy. I'm going to go to a training center. Uh, but when we get back, we're going to set aside this weekend or this period of time, and we're actually going to do something together. We're going to yeah, maintain that bond between you know those that you love. So you can do it. It, it's not easy, uh, but if you're committed to your family, you'll be able to find a way to make it happen, and that's what's important. All right, Korea, go ahead. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Five first class. Five first class West with the first time of the day. My question is with the deactivation of the first time of the day, the rotation of the day. Korea, I'm going to go ahead and interrupt you. If you could just step closer to the microphone, it's really hard to hear you. My name is. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. With the, uh, my name is Private First Class West with the First Armored Brigade Combat Team. With the activation of the First Armored Brigade, uh, the First Armored Brigade replacing us, is this something you can see with future units overseas? Okay, so I think so. With the deactivation, of brigade, you're asking how that mission is going to be filled. Is that what you asked? Yes, sir. Yeah. First, I want to thank you all. For my calculations right. It's like uh, five o'clock in the morning there. <laughs> so I really appreciate you all getting up early to do this. And I bet my guess is you got up a lot earlier than that to be there. So thanks, thanks for doing that. Um, so the plan is we're going to rotate brigades over there, and we're, we're going to do it this year. And so it'll be kind of what we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan all these years. We'll, a brigade will go, uh, they will do a right seat ride, and then uh, they will take over the mission. The reason we decided to do that is twofold. One, um, the fact that what we, were, what, we were, what we were starting to figure out is we were having some readiness issues because we'd rotate seven, 800 soldiers every month out of, out of the 2nd uh, Infantry Division. And so you're in constant training mode, integrating new soldiers. So what we thought we would do is bring a whole brigade over there that's already been training up for a year, that's prepared, and then what you have to do when you get there is sustain it. The other is with the downsizing of the Army, that allows us to downsize a little bit but still keep our mission focused forward in Korea. So I'm very excited about how it's going to work. We noticed that we've started rotating a battalion this year and we think that's gone very well, so that was kind of a test. So we're pretty excited about it. I don't have anything there. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, start again with 173rd. 
Good evening, gentlemen. I'm Specialist Laverne from the 1st Battalion, 503rd Infantry Regiment, 173rd Airborne Brigade. My question to you, Sergeant Major, during your long career, did you, what were your guiding principles leading you to your position? And did you ever think you would be in that position today? Well, no, actually, I did not think I would be in this position today. Uh, <laughs> And actually, I got asked uh, three times before I actually competed whether or not, you know, that I uh, said I did not want to compete because I couldn't find a, a way to balance what I thought was important in my life, my family, and the requirements of this job. But I had a mentor that came to talk to me about it, and uh, that's when I chose to compete. And I just didn't feel like it was, uh, I could commit to the job if I wasn't 100% committed to do it. Um, I had a great mentor. A guy named Lou Tolini, who was an American Samoan, uh, Vietnam era veteran, was at the twilight of his career, and he was my first tank commander. And, uh, and Sergeant uh, Tolini could not read. Uh, that was back in 1981. Uh, but he was a phenomenal leader, and he would have the crew uh, conduct PMCS and all the different things that we could do. Uh, and he really uh, took me under his wing and said, hey, uh, you're kind of a punk, and you don't really want to listen. And uh, if you will just listen to what I tell you, you will be successful in the army. And uh, and I think I dropped a road wheel or something on his foot right after that, and he was uh, very upset with me after that. And uh, but I learned, and I, I had somebody that I could look up to that inspired me to be better than I was and to challenge me. Uh, on a daily basis, and that leader, I think, is what, uh, actually, I don't think, I know is what made me choose the Army as my career. I knew after about six months this is what I wanted to do because it was about the people and the leadership, and it filled a void for me, which unlike the chief, you know, my mom was a sole parent. I was a latchkey kid, got in a lot of trouble when I was young, and I didn't have somebody to put the, you know, put up my John Brown parts when I needed it, and uh, Sergeant Tolini did, and I uh, attribute my success in a great part to him and his leadership. First Corps, go ahead. Hey, you gentlemen. My name is Specialist Marabello. I'm with HHB Bravo um, First Corps. My question is a medical-related question. Um, soldiers serve in a variety of austere environments um, where there are high concentrations of parasites, in the local population. This risk extends to our service members. Um, what can the Army do to combat this increased risk? Well, I think what we have to be able to do is understand that many, as you mentioned, many places that we go are going to be very difficult places that have pretty bad conditions. We've all been in those places. So what we have to do is we have to have a very sophisticated comprehensive way to do it, really take a look at our soldiers. And, you know, what we do when soldiers deploy somewhere and they come back, we ask them to fill out questionnaires about their health and what they experience. And what we find a lot of times is they don't fill those things out properly. Is usually, they're, you know, it's right when you get home from a deployment and you're in a rush and you don't want to take the time. And, and, and so what's important for us is to collect the data so we understand what you've been exposed to and how we then can ensure that we monitor you to make sure you don't have any health risk. In addition to that, we have to be able to train soldiers to operate in austere environments and understand what, what, you, sh what you should do, what you shouldn't do, which, which decreases the risk of you getting infected with whatever disease it might be. You know, and that's one of the reasons why we give a lot of soldiers, if you know you stand in line, you get five, six shots. I, I tell everybody over 38 years, I think I've gotten thousands of shots in my body, so I don't know if I can get any disease. I should be immune from everything. But part of that is because we collect data, and that helps us to build up immunities to malaria and you know other, other potential sicknesses that are out there. That's why we do that. So we have a comprehensive program of inoculation that we do. We try to train soldiers to ensure they understand the risks. And then we collect the information when they come back to ensure that they are providing us and letting us know what's changed in their lives physically 
so we can follow up if we have to. That's why it's important that all soldiers uh, fill out that information when we ask. Yeah. Yeah, does, uh, do we have somebody from Medco? Yeah. yeah. Joe Ma Keenan. Ma'am, did you have something to add? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, that is a great question, and, and sir, you're exactly spot on. With our, our PHA and our P PDHRA, we gather information from soldiers about their exposures. We also have the U.S. Army Public Health Command located at Aberdeen, Maryland, that trains and sends out teams to train units before they deploy on the particular exposures that might be in that particular theater of operations. We take water and soil samples uh, as well as other samples while uh, soldiers are deployed, whether that be in a location like uh, Sierra Leone or Afghanistan or Iraq uh, or Kosovo. We take those samples and we bring those back to Public Health Command and test those and we keep those samples so that we can uh, determine if uh, what exposures are, whether it's to air, soil, water. Uh, but it is very important that when you fill out your PHA and your PDHRAs that you're very accurate uh, in what you believe you might have been exposed to because we do take that, that data and analyze it. But we do have that in a uh, repository, Aberdeen, and we also have on the website where you can actually pull down if you're deploying to a particular area information of what uh, vectors, parasites that you might uh, exposed to. And I'll just remind everybody, because it is flu season, uh, please remember to wash your hands. That is the number one thing you can do to prevent uh, the spread of uh, disease or vectors, and we found that since uh, Washington crossed the Potomac. Thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, 80 second, go ahead. Questions in regards to the cultural support teams. As troops were being withdrawn from Afghanistan, the training and selection for cultural support teams was stopped. With the escalating situations in the Middle East, do you see any potential for those programs to be reinstated? Yeah, so we obviously learned obviously about how important the cultural support teams were. I mean, they really did an incredible job uh, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so, we, we reduced, we eliminated quite a few. We still have some training going on, but we're going to have to, we'll, we'll have to constantly review that and see if that's what we need as we continue to get these new missions going forward because we have found them to be very helpful and the, the ability of them to collect information and provide us insights was invaluable. So, yes, we, we are going to constantly assess that, look at it to see if we have to reinstate that program and we will let people know when we make those decisions. But thank, that's a great question. And in fact, I'm going to ask that question and find out where we are with it. So thanks for asking that. All right, go ahead, Fort Benning. Fort Benning, go ahead. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Staff Sergeant Jones from the Airborne and Ranger Training Brigade. My question is about gender integration and females in Ranger School. The next couple of months, we'll be having females enter into Ranger School. And my question is, what would you consider as a success? Would it be the percentage of females that actually graduate or the number of females that actually attend the school? Well, frankly, uh, so thank you for the question, a great question. Uh, we're running a pilot, as you just said, over the next few months to kind of do an assessment of how well uh, women do in ranger school. And we're just going to kind of, there is no success. We're just going to kind of let the statistics speak for themselves as we go through this. The main thing that I'm focused on is that the standards will remain the same. Uh, that, you know, we have certain standards for ranger school. Those standards will not change. And that, you know, in order to earn that tab, you're going to have to ensure you do all the things necessary to earn that tab. 
but we want to try a pilot to see uh, let let women give women the opportunity to do that. And that's what we're going to do. And then after that, we're going to take a look at the data, and we'll move forward one way or the other. And, I, and we have not defined success. It, it is not based on we don't know if it's if five people graduate, a hundred, or if nobody graduates. It, uh, it's definitely not how many people start the program. But we want to do an assessment to see how does it go. What do we what 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 do we learn from this? And then we'll decide how we move forward. So this is just a, a pilot to gain information for us to understand where we are and how then we will, we will then take that data and make a decision on how we want to go forward. There are no pre -con preconceived notions on what the outcome will be. My only question uh, uh, to you, Sergeant, is what do you think about it? As a instructor at the Airborne and Ranger Training Brigade, what are your specific thoughts about this uh, pilot that we're conducting, and what do you feel, or how do you feel about uh, women uh, receiving the Ranger Tech? I mean, I feel it's a great idea, and I feel like this is something that should have came along years ago, and I feel that the group that comes through, I believe that it will be very successful. And the work that we put in here Ranger instructors will be ready to take on whoever comes. Good. Well, I appreciate I appreciate your leadership on that, and I think it's important to recognize all we expect is that soldiers that uh, attend the uh, the Ranger school are uh, meeting the standards as outlined in the Ranger handbook and in the Ranger instruction. That's it. it whether it's male or female, for us that doesn't matter. What it matters is adherence to the current standard and to see where we stand from a physical standpoint with our, our female soldiers as we expand the opportunities for women in the service. And I appreciate your leadership on that. Yeah, and I just want to add, I've been very impressed with the great work that's gone on out of Fort Benning, specifically the Ranger Training Brigade to prepare for this. I know it's been a lot of extra work and effort, and I truly appreciate what's gone on down there. It's been tremendous. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. All right, Yusisak, go ahead. <clears throat> Special Sonokomov, and I represent 95th Civil Affairs Brigade. My question to you, gentlemen, is in regards to tuition assistance. You mentioned earlier that the Army is a profession. How do you feel about the recent changes to tuition assistance? And do you feel that it's doing everything it can to educate our Army workforce? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk about oh. All right, so. Uh, we made a change last year uh, with Army tuition. As you remember, back in 2013, on April uh, 8th, we uh, uh, notified the force that we had uh, uh, terminated tuition assistance for the remainder of the fiscal year because of budgetary constraints. Uh, after uh, Congress and uh, we and the Army took a look at it, we decided to reinstitute tuition assistance. However, uh, we also felt that there needed to be some control measures on tuition assistance. And that was, was that you uh, made a commitment to be a United States Army soldier and that you needed to actually prove yourself within your profession over the uh, first year at your unit of assignment. So you had to do the soldier things that we expect you to do. Qualify your weapon, demonstrate physical fitness, continue to grow and develop and understand your responsibilities as Whatever your affairs, uh, whatever your MOS may be, and then after the one-year period, you could in fact also take on the added benefit of, tu of using tuition assistance for college while you're uh, on active duty or in the Army National Guard and Reserve. And the real point of that was to tie your professional responsibilities to a benefit that you receive from the Army for you to do something for yourself and on your own. We're a big advocate of tuition assistance in college. We are. Uh, we believe we've got enough money to sustain the program uh, into the future, uh, and that tied with your idea and your, your recognition of your soldier responsibility, we can provide you an added benefit so you don't have to use your post-9-11 GI Bill. We did not reduce the amount of tuition assistance. We did change the amount of hours from 16 to 15, but we think that's reasonable in line with your duties and possible deployment. So uh, I think we've got a great plan. I think it is tied to understanding your profession. And uh, we're very, very optimistic about the future for TA. 
Yeah, I, I would just add that, you know, we want, part of the Army is, is a couple things. Is we want you to be able to uh, prove yourself individually. We, we want to give you that opportunity. And so part of that is through the tuition assistance program. Like everything else, I don't think we should just give it to anybody who walks through the door. you got to earn it through the first year. And if you perform and do all the things that Sergeant Major said you're asked to do, then it's open to you and you can take advantage of it the best you can. And I think that's the right way to do it. And so what that allows us to do is the sol you know, soldiers earn it, and the ones who earn it, they can continue to develop themselves, and there'll be plenty of money there for them to do what they need to do to gain their education. And, and so, in my mind, it's the best way forward. Uh, and again, we, we think it's really important for our soldiers to have tuition assistance available to them. All right, Fort Lee, go ahead. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Staff Sergeant Bell from 23rd Quartermaster Brigade. And my question to you is, with deployments winding down, the opportunities for junior enlisted soldiers to get promoted is becoming more difficult. Is the Army going to relook the promotion system? No. Next question. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, we have a good promotion system. I would compete the promotion system that we have against any of the other services uh, because we look at the whole soldier concept. We don't just provide a test uh, that tests cognitive abilities. We look at everything that the person does and determine whether or not they've got the potential for future promotion. Your question about promotions becoming more difficult are, in fact, almost directly tied to the, the challenges the Army faces with reducing the size of the force. We can't just terminate a person you know, right away. We usually try to get them through their ETS date. And as we reduce the size of the, of the people in the Army and we reduce the amount that we're recruiting, they're not necessarily always in balance. Here's what I would tell you is that any soldier can be, uh, can be promoted to the next rank, even if the cutoff score is 798. But it takes a lot of hard work, takes self-discipline, and takes an engaged leader to help them get to their full potential. Anyone that doesn't get pr uh, promoted, even if the score is 798, has some things they can work on with their leader so that they can improve themselves, even if it's at 798. And we see it every single month that even in those what we call maxed out MOSs, someone ends up getting promoted with 800 points. And that's because they, they did everything they possibly could at that time. Over time, uh, the challenges with high cutoff scores will start to come down as we rebalance the force and get to the size of the force that the chief described in 2018. So continue to work hard to get promoted, have your leader help you to get those other points that you need, whether that's PT, weapons, civilian education, and, and you can get there. And, uh, and we really want you to stay with us. I think, I think you need to understand what's happened in the Army. So I don't know when you came in the Army, but from 2004 to 2012, the Army was growing. And so because it was growing, we were promoting people faster. Frankly, I would make the argument we were promoting people too fast because they, a lot of people were not qualified for the rank that they were getting promoted to. They didn't go to the schools they were supposed to. They didn't have the experience they were supposed to. Uh, now that we're downsized, it might be take a little bit more difficult, but it's going to balance itself out to where it's the right level, where we think it encompasses the right level of, of, of training, education, and experience that allows us to have the best non-commissioned officers and officers that we need. We were promoting officers too fast as well. Uh, we had to because we were growing the Army. So now that we're downsizing, it's, it has slowed a little bit, but it's still within historical norms, our promotion system. And what we want to do is promote the right people. You know, we just don't want to promote people. We want to promote the right people. So we maintain a strong Army. What makes our Army different than every other Army in the world is our non-commissioned officer corps. And we want to maintain high standards in our non-commissioned officer corps. And we want to make sure we're promoting those who are trained, who are experienced, and who will continue to lead in the future. And as long as we do that, we're going to be successful. So there's going to be opportunities for promotion. We, we the SAR major and I, clearly understand that we cannot limit. we got to have promotions. People want to move forward. And we're going to make sure the system allows that. But it is not going to be as fast as it was 
you know, five years ago or four years ago or because we were growing the Army, and frankly, I, I would argue that it was even too fast. Okay, go ahead, Korea. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is CW3 Hazeman. I am the battalion maintenance tech for 3A CAB, the second rotational unit to Korea. Uh, we deployed over here with roughly 80% MTO strength personnel in the maintenance category, which drastically reduced our maintenance capabilities. My question is, will rotational units continue to deploy in a TDY status, or will something change in the future? Thank you. Yeah, so what, what we're going to do, it's going to be continue to be a TDY status. Uh, that's, that's the system we have in place now. But what we're, going to what we're working at is making sure you deploy at a higher percentage rate. Uh, and that it's, 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 it's at a, you know, somewhere above 90% is what our goal is to deploy every unit going over there. So you have the capability to do what's necessary. And you know we've learned a lot from the initial rotation, so we're adjusting some policies and how we address these issues, and we'll continue to make it better over time. I get briefed uh, quite regularly on, on the status of the percentage of, of readiness and, and how we're going to meet those readiness numbers as we go forward. So uh, I think it's gone, for the most part, it's gone well, but there are things that we have to correct. And I think you identified one of those areas that we have to watch a little bit closer to make sure that we're manning all the critical skills at the right levels as we move forward. And we're, and we're taking a, we're looking at that very closely. I appreciate the feedback, actually. Nothing. Okay. 173rd, go ahead with your next question. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Specialist Little from 2nd Battalion, 503rd. Infantry Regiment 173rd Airborne Brigade. And my question for you today is, with the downsizing of the Army, how do you believe this will affect the readiness and training of soldiers for threats in the near future? Well, I think as so, our goal is to have, a, like I said earlier, have an Army that is sized that can be, we actually gonna have to be at a higher readiness level than we have been in the past because we're gonna be smaller. So as we get smaller, I want to develop a readiness capability that's even greater than what it is today, which requires an investment in, in training, an investment in leader development, an investment in our schools to ensure that all our leaders and our collective training that we do is fully funded. We're still about two to three years away from getting to the place I want us to be in terms of having that right balance of investment into readiness. But we're getting better. We're better than we were last year. And this year will be a little bit better than, I mean, uh, 14 was better than 13, 15 will be a little bit better than 14. So I think we're making progress in ensuring that we are increasing the level of readiness. And that, that's our goal. Because everybody asks me, the best way to take care of our soldiers are to make sure they are prepared and ready to accomplish the mission we ask them to do. And for me, it's important to me that we invest in that. And so we're going to continue to invest in that to increase the level of readiness and proficiency in all our units. So I realize that as we're in this time period of downsizing and reduced resources, we're a little out of balance right now. But we're working as hard as we can to get ourselves back in the balance over the next couple of years. Uh, Specialist Little, the only thing that I'd add is, you know, I, I want you to think about trust and that the senior army leadership is doing everything that it possibly can to ensure you've got the right tools, the training, and uh, the equipment that you need so that when you are asked to go someplace, like you were just a little while ago, uh, that you have everything you need to do to do your job and do it well in, in whatever we ask you to do. I need you and I'd ask you and your team leaders and squad leaders to talk about, okay, what can we control? We can control how well we prepare and how well we execute and then uh, after action review what we're doing. Is it actually tied to what the commander has said that we need to focus on? And if you're doing those things which you can control, you'll be successful. The Army is committed to making sure that you are ready, okay, that your unit is ready. And we'll do everything we, we need to do to ensure that. But at the point where the rubber meets the road, we need you to do your part of the bargain to make sure that it's quality training, that it's tied to a task that your commander has set as a priority, and that when you get it done, 
that you look at it and determine what can we learn so we get better the next time. All right, first core, go ahead. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Staff Sergeant Hernandez with the 5th Mobile Public Affairs Division Detachment, first core. My question is for Sergeant Major Chandler. Um, did you meet or exceed the goals you set forth for your time as Sergeant Major of the Army? And what do you see your successor focusing on? Well, I believe that my successor will focus on what the Chief of Staff of the Army has said that he wants him to do. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you know, when I, I was asked when I first became the Sergeant Major of the Army, what do you want to, what do you want to do? What do you want to change? What do you want to fix? Until you're the Sergeant Major of the Army and you understand the operating environment, it's premature to say, I want to fix this, that, or the other thing. So I did not have any specific list of tasks when I came up to the office of the Sergeant Major of the Army that I wanted to achieve. I had to listen to what my boss said uh, and said, these are the priorities that I want you to focus on and this is what I expect you to do. And you know, I'm sure that uh, General Odierno and Sergeant Major Daly will speak about that routinely and, and continue to move the Army forward. But my job uh, is to serve at the, at the pleasure of the Chief of Staff of the Army and focus on those areas that he feels is a uh, priority for me. And then to help soldiers like you listen to what your concerns are and bring it back to the Army leadership so they make informed decisions. You know, and I can tell you uh, uh, with first-hand knowledge that the information that when I go out and travel and provide back to the Chief and the Secretary provides them greater awareness of what's on your mind. I think that's a big part of what the SMA has got to do. And, and so uh, you got to listen to what your boss has to say, just like you do. And what, if that's their priority, it's now your priority. So let me, so I would tell you that some of the priorities I gave to Sergeant Major Chandler and what I'm going to give to the new Sergeant Major of the Army are, there's about four of them that I'll, I'll just quickly outline for you. One is, as somebody already brought up, is I believe only we can, uh, the elimination of, se elimination of sexual assault in the Army. Everybody needs to be involved with that. And NCOs can have a bigger difference in that than anything else we do. So I need the Sergeant Major of the Army to continue to help me lead in helping us to eradicate sexual assault. Second is to ensure that we continue to understand what the Army profession is and what it means to be a professional and what we expect. What are the standards? What are the ethics and moral values that we, that we value in the Army that makes us different than anybody else in society. So those are kind of two major things. Two smaller but just as important things is NCO 2020 and how we develop our NCOs of the future. And so our major's been helping me to really move towards select, train, educate, promote, and get, get back to that. That's hard because we haven't done that over the last several years because the Army's grown so fast. But, but for me, that's critically important. And then, and then the last thing is home station training to really focus on home station training and that we have our NCOs and our officers focus and the Sergeant Major said it three times since we've been sitting there <laughs> to you all and that is make sure that you're making the most out of the resources you're given you plan for and conduct the best training possible for whatever element you're responsible for so those are really the, there's others but those are the main priorities that I've given Sergeant Major Chandler and those will not change for the new Sergeant Major because they're, they're, they take time. Uh, and so uh, I think those will be the things, and there'll be some other things, but those are the things that you'll see us continue to focus on. Okay, 82nd. All right. We'll come back to the 82nd. Um, Fort Benning, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir, Sergeant Major. Uh, my name is Captain Edwards. I'm an assistant operations officer with the 194th Armored Brigade. And uh, my question is for you, sir, uh, in reference to officer separation boards. Will there be any officer separation boards in the near future? And if so, what are the uh, target year groups and ranks? Yeah, so uh, there are going to continue to be officer separation boards uh, over the next couple of years. I can't, I'll get back, I can't tell you the exact years we're going to look at, but one thing I've said, we will not look at one year group twice. We manage officers by year group. That's one thing that's different about officers and NCOs. 
is that you're managed by your group, and we have, we are excess in certain year groups. And so we are going to look at it, and some and, and we're deciding now whether we look at as senior captains or as majors. Uh, and so we're we're, t we're taking a look at. It. We're also trying to use other tools that we might have. So we're balancing promotion selection rates with potential uh, officer separation boards, and we want to do a combination of both of those to determine how we reduce the force. So I, I, I don't know the year groups exactly. I just don't have that on the top of my head. But I'll tell you, if your group has already been looked at, they will, they will, our goal is that they will not be looked at again. But uh, as almost every year group, uh, you know, from 2010 on is going to be looked at at some time over the next three or four years. All right, 80 second, are you back with us? Can't hear you. All right, we will come back to you guys. We can't hear you right now, so we'll move on, um, move on to USASOC. You're on. Good Gentlemen, I'm sorry, Powell from ASOREC. Question is, what are we doing to engage leaders to enforce basic army standards, especially our young, our mid-grades, NCOs and officers. I didn't catch it. Sorry, can you go ahead and repeat yourself? Yeah, you cut off for a second. What are we doing to engage our leaders to enforce basis military standards, especially our military officers and military NCOs and officers? If I understand what you're asking, you're asking what are we uh, doing to engage great officers and NPOs on, on discipline and standards? Yes, I Major. Well, uh, I know the Chief and I and other Army senior leaders travel frequently and engage with uh, uh, soldiers uh, across the Army and talk about the issues that are presenting with us and their role, uh, and part of that is obviously enforcing discipline and standards. I think more importantly, you know, the chief and I can get around to, to Fort Bragg once every, I don't know, four or five months maybe. But you're engaged with your leaders who have heard, you know, in more frequent forms what uh, what it is that we need to do as an army. Uh, I, I think that we know what the standards are and we know what discipline is in the army. I think what we've got to do is to do a little bit better job of actually executing as leaders, those disciplines and standards as a force. Uh, I know you may be aware I'm on I'm on Facebook. I get a lot of questions about discipline, discipline and standards, and I try to respond to those. Uh, but I think what is most important: uh, talk with the leaders that you you work for, and and maybe one level above about the the concerns you may have, and try and get those answered. Uh, but if you've got a specific question. I'd be happy to follow up if you want to finish up. Yeah, and if I if I could, you, you know, you have to remember the army is 1.1 million men and women, yeah. and so what we have to do is we have to believe in the chain of command. And so I have quarterly two and three star conferences and SAR majors, uh, equivalent SAR majors that come to that, and the SAR major and I talk a lot about the, what our expectations are to them and their expectations of what we expect them to do in terms of ensuring we have the right discipline and, and enforcing standards and doing it with dignity and respect. And so we expect them then to take that and operate and use that through the brigade commanders and the battalion commanders and company commanders and our programs in place that have discussions about this. This also goes back to what I talked about earlier, select, train, educate, promote. I believe we have some mid-grade NCOs and officers that maybe did not get the appropriate training because we were moving so quickly during war that we have to go back and ensure that they understand what's expected of them. And that we expect them to what the standards are and how, how what's the right way to enforce standards. There's a right and wrong way to enforce standards. And so it's important that we constantly have that discussion. We continually update what we do at our school, 
our NCO schools, our officers, talk about this as we go through that. So I think all of those things is what we expect. And that's part of the profession, is having these discussions and talking about how we execute, how do we enforce standards and discipline throughout the course. Those are key and essential elements of being successful as, a, as an army as a whole and as an individual unit, depending on what unit you're in. All right, we'll move on to Fort Lee. Good day, gentlemen. Captain Hans Mogelgaard with the United States Army Transportation School. And I'd like to ask, how do you see the, how, how do you both see the Army's leadership shifting policies and procedures to the advances in technology where everybody can capture everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, with their mobile devices? Um, how, do you, how do you foresee that going? Sorry, I know you want to say a lot about that. <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think so. For, first off, everybody has to realize that the world we live in has changed significantly. And that everything that, whether we like it or not, everything we do is more public. And information moves very quickly. And so we have to be able to, we have to be able to be adaptive and operate in an environment where information is available in, in great volumes and to lots of different people. And so what we have to do is develop leaders that, can, that feel comfortable operating in that environment. And develop individuals that can that can that can move quickly in that environment. That understand how to use the information to make decisions. That understand how to sort through it. Understand that we we live in a very dynamic world today, and that's not going to get easier. It's going to actually get more dynamic. And so what we we are starting to do is we're starting in all of our training programs to institute critical thinking and understanding the use of information, and understanding how that equates in the Army and how we want to move forward. But we also have to remember that we have to maintain basic standards and discipline. And so it's got to be that right balance between this increase in information and the standards and discipline that we expect. And so it's a combination of all of those things. And we have to learn this together as we go forward. So we are absolutely focused on understanding the information environment that we operate in. And we have to constantly change how we are training ourselves to operate in that. It's a challenge for me, it's a challenge for a squad leader, and it's a challenge for a platoon leader. And we got to understand how we operate in that environment. The only other thing I'd add real quickly, sir, is that I think what's one of the most important things we have to recognize is that the best form of communication within the Army is between two people or others face-to-face -face or in a video teleconference like this. And sometimes we skew towards, you know, uh, an email or a text message or something else where the intent of the person may be lost in the words and the way that a person may be feeling when they read them. I go back to mission command and the very important uh, part of that, which is commander's dialogue. And, and the fact that you're supposed to come together, have a face-to-face -face look at one another and describe what it is that that you need and what it is that the mission is. And, and if we lose sight of the fact that the passion, the emphasis uh, that face-to-face -face, uh, discussions provide, that may in fact cause us to not be successful in what we're trying to do. And so I think those tools are very important. They do make life easier in some ways. They also make it much more complicated uh, when you get to looking at, you know, two or three hundred emails a day and trying to figure out what somebody's trying to say. So a balance is important, but never lose sight of the fact that looking and talking to somebody in the eye is really the best form that we can use within the Army. So it's 325, sir. Students, do Korea and 87. Okay, sir. Go ahead, Korea, with your final question for today. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Sean Ralston with 3 Cav Rotational Unit. Uh, my question is, uh, what's, uh, why is there such a big push for uh, uniform changes, and are we going to be issuing those out, or are we going to be uh, doing like we did with the ASUs and paying for them? So uh, the reason, so uniform changes are important, especially the ACUs. I consider, especially in the Army, ACUs are part of our system of protecting ourselves. And we got to have the best system possible that allows our soldiers to be protected as we deploy them around the world to conduct combat operations. And we've done a, a significant amount of analysis that tells us the ACU doesn't do very well in camouflaging us and in protecting us in multiple environments. 
and that the multicam that we're using in Afghanistan does a much better job. So, so we are going to go to the multicam uniform. And for me, it's about protecting our soldiers. Now, those are going to be issued. Uh, now, it'll, you're not going to have to wait for it to be issued. So if you're not patient, then soldiers might go buy their own multicams, but they will be issued uh, when, when, once they're available. And, uh, and so in my mind, it's, up, it's depending on how patient you are. I, you know, I've been through a lot of uniform changes in my career, and, and soldiers don't tend to be patient, so they go out and buy their own. But they will be issued at, at some time. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is issuing is going to take place if you're on a deployment. Uh, but the, because that will be a fire resistant uniform. But if you're at home station and, and it comes time for you, your other uniform, your ACU uniform to wear out, you will be purchasing the uniform that you wear on a daily basis outside of deployment. And that has happened, you know, throughout history. Uh, you have a clothing bag uh, replacement uh, that we give you, your clothing allowance every year. And there is a strategy on how that number is derived by. So if you'd like to know how that works, go to the G4 website, look on Army uniforms, and it will show you the clothing bag and the wear out dates for the items, and that's why you get that money each year. Uh, but I'm very excited about the, the uh, replacement for the ACU. It's a much better uniform. It provides much greater protection for you, and, uh, and I think that you will appreciate it once you get it. We put a lot of thought into its design. We'll add some items to it that you don't currently have on the ACU that you're wearing. And uh, I think you'll find it to be a much better quality uniform than what you have today. Okay, and we'll take the final question for today from the 82nd. Hey, sir, Star Major, Special Rothschild here with the 82nd Airborne Division, 2nd Brigade. My question is, is there still anything in the making for a new Army physical fitness test? And if so, uh, what would this consist of, and would, when can we expect to see this change? That's a great question. So when I first became the chief almost three years ago, they brought me a new physical fitness test, which to me was inadequate. So I sent them back to the drawing board to do analysis. And what we're doing is as we've looked at, actually, frankly, we've looked at the qualifications of every MOS, we're now starting to establish what are the things we want to measure in a physical fitness test. So I expect that in the next several months, TRADOC, Training and Doctrine Command, will come forward with a recommendation. This is maybe how I see it. I think there might still be a general PT test that might be similar to sit-ups, push-ups, two-mile run, but then there'll be a, a functional test per by MOS that really focuses on what strengths you need to be in a certain MOS. We're not so they're still working on all of this, so we're not sure. But I'm waiting for a recommendation to come forward based on two and a half years worth of testing that we've done in order for us to understand physiologically when we go to war what what are the what are the requirements that we have to have for somebody to be able to do their job under stressful conditions, and what do we want to be able to test that make sure that our soldiers maintain a certain level of fitness. And so I think that'll happen here pretty soon, but I'm, I, it, so I expect in the next couple of months I'll get some sort of recommendation. And my only other follow-up to that is, is you know, we've done several things actually over the uh, the last two years in order to set the conditions for what we think we're going to go to next. So we put uh, uh, the master fitness trainer course into into operation, which I think is paying huge dividends right now. We're assessing what the actual physical demands are for every single MLS, like the chief said, so we can get after what's important. Can you do the physical task associated with your MOS? And I think that'll drive change across the force as we move forward over the next several years. I can see where things like uh, MAR2 or MEB processes start with, can you meet the physical demands of your MOS? And if not, let's see if there's another place where we can help you continue to serve, but maybe not in the same MOS. And I think that will give us greater fidelity on the, on the ability for the Army to put boots on the ground. As a smaller force, we're going to have more people that can get out to the uh, to where we're going to deploy to, and I think this will help us. Uh, if you have an idea of the Ranger Athlete Warrior Program or at Fort Drum, the Mountain Athlete Warrior Program, I'm pretty sure that's what the Chief's talking about as we move forward. We really want to get soldiers 
who get injured back into the fight as quickly as possible, and a big part of that will be the physical fitness program. We have. Yeah, and I would just say more important than the physical fitness test is actually the physical fitness program that we want to establish that maximizes and optimizes soldier physical capabilities. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's why it's taken us a little bit longer to come up with the right solution. Just, uh, hey, I appreciate this. This is, uh, you know, it makes me a little uneasy because I'm more used to everybody in the same room talking. But thank you for your questions. Thank you for your service. And thank you for your commitment to the Army and the nation. You're the top 1%, and we really appreciate all that you do each and every day. Yeah, thanks for the quest great questions. Not, all of them were terrific. And, uh, and it's important for us to hear what's on your mind, so thanks for that. And again, I want to thank the soldiers in Korea and in Germany, and Italy, excuse me, who stayed up and who got up early to be here with us. I also want to thank the soldiers from across our Army uh, out, of, out of Fort Lewis and at Fort Bragg at 82nd, USASOC, Fort Benning, Fort Lee, Thank, thank all of you. Uh, you. You are what makes us who we are. And I hope you're proud to wear the uniform that we wear. I know I am. I'm proud to stand beside you every day. So God bless all of you, and once again, Happy New Year. Thanks. Army strong. Army strong.